Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Today, Tesla just got rear-ended in its earnings report. We're going to take it to the shop and inspect the damage. Then, remember SPAC mania? The SEC does, and it's doing its best to make sure it never happens again. It's Thursday, January 25th. Let's ride. This certainly got everyone talking yesterday. Jon Stewart is returning to The Daily Show on Comedy Central. As host from 1999 to 2015, Stewart turned the show into this comedic and political force that no one has been able to replicate since. So why come back, John? Well, the new gig seems pretty cushy. Stewart will serve as executive producer and only sit in the host chair once a week on Mondays. Toby, do you think Stewart can make the show relevant again, or is late night just a dead medium? I mean, I think Comedy Central is certainly happy to have him back because in the last season of Trevor Noah's stint, viewership was down 70% from the peak John Stewart era. I do think the biggest difference between 2015, which is his last year of hosting, and now, is the fact that TikTok exists now. So I do think that there is sort of this viral cycle that will boost some of these clips even further than his like viral clips from the, the days gone by. So I do think it's relevant. It's an election year. Jon Stewart's like kind of uniquely good at navigating the insanity of these of these political moments. So I think that it's still relevant. Yeah. But specifically on social media. Like we should expect Jon Stewart to, you know, his when he hosts Monday night, we expect him to see be all over TikTok on Tuesday. Very similar to what happens with SNL now. Saturday right. nights, you know, I don't know how how many people actually watch on Saturday night, but you bet people are watching on YouTube on Sunday. Same with John Oliver's rants on HBO. They come on actually live Sunday night, and then no one kind of sees them till the next day. Maybe that'll happen with Stewart, but I expect it to be a little more limited effect if he's only hosting once a week. That, that TikTok, though, it, it will send it, send it viral. Before we jump into the show today, we have a quick word from our sponsor, Veeam. Neil, I was playing Scrabble yesterday, and I looked into my hand and saw a V, two E's, an M, and an open A to play off of. The Veeam was staring me right in the face. Uh, did you play it? Oh, you bet your buttocks I did. Now, my opponent wasn't happy, but once I told them that Veeam believes in radical resilience, which is all about being able to take data disruptions in stride and recover quickly, they were more accommodating. Probably like a 20-point word, too. Actually, 40. I snagged that double word score. Head to Veeam.com today to discover more. That's V-E-E-A-M.com today. Let's dive into some Tesla earnings where everyone's favorite auto slash AI slash robotics slash energy company kind of disappointed across the board. Top line revenue more or less met expectations coming in at 21, 25.17 billion versus 25.87 billion expected. But in a decidedly un-Tesla move, it warned of, quote, notably slower growth in 2024. Costs related to ramping up cyber truck production, along with increased expenses for AI projects, combined with the recent price cuts, also dented profitability. That said, it's Tesla, so there's always a bright side. First, Tesla reported earlier this month that it delivered 484,000 cars in Q4, beating estimates and setting an all-time record. But the biggest bright spot for Tesla fans is there's a new next-gen affordable car in the works, codenamed Redwood, set to begin production in 2025. Elon first teased plans for a 25,000 EV. EV all the way back in 2020, but now it looks like there's a timeline in place for what would be Tesla's cheapest mass market car ever. Tesla is always so polarizing around earnings seasons, depending on your view of the company. How's the future looking for it right now, Neil? You have a way rosier take than I think I do, and investors do. The stock is down nearly 8% uh, this morning. This is a company that has ran into Holland Tunnel level traffic. It's slowing down very considerably, facing the broader decline in demand for EVs in general. There's hyper competition from China and BYD with their $25,000 cars. It hasn't really released any new compelling products for the mass market recently besides the Cybertruck. Not many people are going to buy that. And investors are seriously worried, not only about the cars, uh, the car maker's growth, but also Elon Musk's leadership and his commitment to Tesla. Yeah, they're, the whole vibe around Tesla right now is different. The mood is different. I mean, it expected a 21% rise in 2024 deliveries, which was 
was well below their annual target of 50% that must set just three years ago. So it just goes to show how different of a landscape we're currently in. And then also remember profit margins has have always been Tesla's kind of knight in shining armor. They've always been able to lap the field when it comes to how profitable they are in terms of compared to legacy automakers. But profit margins did go up slightly to 8.2%, uh, up from 7.6% the previous quarter. But if we go back to last year, it was at 16%. So it just goes to show, again, with those price cuts that they've been doing, that their once unassailable profit margin margin is kind of shrinking right now. This is the stat that kind of made my jaw drop about those price cuts and its shrinking margins. Tesla sold 35% more cars in 2023 than in 2022 its overall sales rose 1% over that time span. So it's selling a lot more cars, but they uh, it, it basically lost its pricing power in this race to the bottom with this hyper-competitive EV market. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned kind of some of the rumblings around Elon Musk's commitment to the company because he said last week that he wanted more control of the company or else he might take his toys and go play elsewhere if he didn't get 25% control of the company, specifically related to some of the AI projects they're carrying out. So there's always like... You're always kind of riding the Elon wave depending on his moods and depending on what he thinks going forward. So, yeah, there's definitely some crack showing in, in Tesla's facade right now. Moving on, Detroit is the place to be these days. Not only are the Lions playing in the NFC Championship game, but the United Auto Workers Union is trying to play kinmaker in the upcoming presidential election. Yesterday, President Sean Fain announced that the influential union, composed of 400,000 workers, would endorse Joe Biden for re-election in a joint appearance with the president. While this wasn't a surprise since unions typically do endorse Democratic candidates, Fain did repeat the type of hardball tactics we witnessed during the UAW strikes last year. Last year, he said that Biden's endorsement wouldn't be freely given like it had been in the past and that Biden had to earn it by showing commitment to unionize auto workers. Biden understood the assignment and headed up to Michigan in the fall to become the first sitting president in history to join the picket line with the UAW. Biden has built himself as the most pro-union president ever. And yesterday he told the union, I'm honored to have your back and you have mine. That's the deal. And for Biden, that's a good deal because the states home to the most UAW members, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, are the battleground states that could determine the election in 2024. Yeah, just as a numbers game, the union vote is a pretty big prize. There's 400,000 active members, 600,000 retired members. So that's a million voters right there. And again, not... The, the union doesn't vote completely as a monolith. Like there is obviously individual people within, in there, but just as a numbers game, it is nice to secure that vote kind of heading into this election cycle. Yeah, so if we actually do want to break down the union vote, they've done internal polling. It seems uh, that they've reported that 30% are typically vote for Democrats, 30% uh, are Republicans, and 30% are swing voters. But when it comes down to the election and actual voting, those 30% can tend to side to Democrats. So in the past few years, Trump has gotten about 30 percent of the union vote. There are definitely some cracks, though, when it comes to the union supporting Biden's kind of agenda, because remember, the Biden's electric electric vehicle transition was a big issue for the union vote for Sean Fain, because they think that it will threaten some of their job security. So it's been interesting because the UAW has tried to push back and prevent the president from issuing some of those EV grants that pri prioritize companies offering higher pay and stuff like that. So it is interesting to see that even though they supported it, there are some kind of pushback within the union itself. Yeah, it hasn't been, uh, it's been a little bit of a rocky relationship because Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, according to the UAW, didn't go far enough to dangle incentives for companies to hire unionized workers. And they are very worried about the transition to electric vehicles because electric vehicles, when you make them, they require a lot fewer parts, a lot fewer uh, people. So it requires 30% less labor than internal combustion engines. So you can see why there's been a rocky relationship here because the UAW wants the, their most important thing is to protect union jobs and the transition to EVs and also re our reliance on foreign countries for EV parts threatens to disrupt that equilibrium a little bit. It, just to zoom out a little bit to see like where unions are in the country right now, it is interesting because union uh, membership is at record low rates, even though the, like, the sheer number of workers in unions 
increase, but the workers of non-union companies actually increased at a faster rate, so the percentage went down. But support for unions are at record high. A recent Gallup poll put it at 67% of the general population was supportive of unions, which is high from the record lows of kind of during the Great Recession. So it is interesting that unions are both falling in, in relevance, but also gaining in popularity, just as to provide some context of where unions are right now. All right, let's move on. This next story details the saga of a baby clothes manufacturer swept up by an internet mailstorm of mishandled parental leave, insincere apologies, and online outrage. So there's this company called Kite Baby that is known by lots of younger parents in sales sleepwear for babies. We're talking $75 sleep bags, $48 infant jogger sets. You get the picture. But the outrage started when word got out that the company had declined a new parent's request to work remotely while her adopted son was in the neonatal intensive of care unit. Sarah Green Carmichael, an opinion columnist for Bloomberg, likened it to Patagonia getting caught chopping down a redwood tree. It's just antithetical to the entire brand. Then the outrage cycle continued after Kite Baby's founder and CEO issued what many took to be an insincere apology where she was clearly reading off a piece of paper. She then issued another apology for the previous apology, but the damage was done. Neil, I think the reason this has st struck such a nerve with people and why we're talking about it today is that it combines so many elements of modern American culture, the lack of parental leave for new parents, inflexible working arrangements, social media outrage cycles, brands being insincere. It is a perfect storm. It is a perfect storm. This company stepped in so many piles of bird doo doo. It's hard to know which one to pick at first. Let's um, let's first talk about the apology. Okay, so there were whenever you say that there were two apologies, you put apology plural. You know that the company has a PR disaster. If you consulted a single PR professional, you would say not to post an apology to TikTok because when you put yourself out on TikTok, that is just. You're, you're just asking for reactions and for this to go viral. I don't know what a better platform would be. Maybe LinkedIn it has a little less virality, but the, the fact is this company lived and died by social media. They were so big on Instagram and TikTok, and that was the reason for their success largely. And so I think they also thought that they could quell the growing uh, criticism also on social media. But this has led to actually significant boycotts because you have moms, filming themselves taking Kite Baby products and literally tossing them out in the snow. So this could have actually material impacts on their on their business. Oh, absolutely. And if you look at the comments under these videos, which I did, it's just people selling other brands that provide alternative to sure. Kite Baby's products. But I also do want to talk about kind of the hot button issue around corporate inflexibility, around remote work requests. I mean, remember, during the height of the pandemic, many working moms kind of got a ton of jobs piled on them. Like you had their actual paying job, then you have to take care of the kids, you have to educate the kids as well. And then as we kind of emerged from the pandemic, remote work was this blessing in disguise. Once their kids went back to school, they finally had the flexibility they've been fighting for for so long. And yet here we are again having this conversation about companies not being accommodating to new moms in flexible work arrangements. And it's just especially a, a baby company. Right. Again, and, and then that touches on the last issue, which is brands being insincere. Corporate consumers right now are very astute and very adept, and they can see through if a brand is actually walking the walk or if they're just talking the talk. And this is just a perfect example of a brand that completely messed up the walk and the walking and the, and the talking. For the final point, I have a question for you. What do the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, and the United States have in common? I got nothing. They are the only six countries in the world without a form of national paid leave. Oh, interesting. So this, so our paid leave policies are very minimal, bare bones paid leave policies. Definitely also in the spotlight uh, with this particular company. I mean, they only offered two weeks of maternal paid leave uh, if you weren't an employee for 12 months or more. And there's no national uh, there's no national law. So Texas, where this company is based, kind of leaves it up to em employers. I think only a quarter of all U.S. Empl private employers offer some sort of paid leave. So that also kind of raised people's ire as to our, you know, the, the fact that we're only one of six countries in the entire world without this type of policy. Yeah, truly ridiculous. All right, before we jump into the next part of our show, we're going to take a quick break. Welcome to Neil's Numbers, the segment where I share three stats from the week's news that will give you full body goosebumps. First up, 
How many 123-year-olds do you know? The answer should be zero, since the oldest human lived 122, but apparently more than 2,200 companies in the world have board directors aged 123 years and above. One listed director was 942 years old, which means they were born in the 11th century. That guy is always complaining about Gen Z. These shocking findings come from a Moody's investigation into shell companies that expose how their complex structure and secrecy could facilitate financial crimes. And it's not just medieval people filling board seats that raised red flags. Thousands of companies had directors below five years old. One China-based textile and clothing manufacturer reported $2 billion in annual revenue despite having one employee. 22,000 entries had a registered address at the Egyptian pyramids, and one individual had 5,700 roles at 2,800 different entities. Shell companies, totally not sketchy at all. Yeah, this is one of my favorite reports ever. Every single nugget just got better than the last. I truly do love the, the textile company that said, we got $2 billion revenue with only a single employee. It is interesting, though, because shell companies do have their place. They have a reason for existing, but also it's also just famously used for lots of corporate fraud. And this is just the tip of the iceberg because this is just one report. So shell companies, man. I mean, 47 and it's not kind of like evenly distributed over the course of the over over the world. When you look at Panama, 47 percent of companies in Panama raised red flags in this Moody's report. Then the Panama Papers come out, and I think they they cleaned up their act a little bit. But it is uh, it is kind of an interesting look at this murky world that's able to facilitate financial crimes. I think one point nine trillion dollars is laundered each year. Okay, my second number is one, which is how many liquor stores there will soon be in Saudi Arabia. The kingdom, a conservative Muslim theocracy, had banned alcohol since 1952, but in the next few weeks, it's planning to open its first liquor store in the capital, Riyadh. Another sign it's loosening strict religious rules to attract foreign investors and tourists. This won't be a free-for-all like Town Hall Liquors in College Park. The store is only open to non-Muslim di diplomats. No people under the age of 21 are allowed in. And in true comedy seller fashion, you can't take pictures or have your phone out. It's a baby step for sure, but it does fit a pattern of Saudi Arabia entering this new chapter of secularization, including reversing a ban on women driving and allowing public entertainment, music, and mixing of genders. This is in a word, symbolic. Yeah, it's definitely symbolic, and it is. there's been this tension of how do you modernize a country that has typically been governed by kind of a lot of religious laws. It is interesting going back to the history of when alcohol was banned, though. Liquor was banned across the country after an intoxicated Saudi prince shot a British diplomat in, 19, in the 1950s following a party. So you can see why they kind of dropped the hammer back then. We'll see if something similar happens in this kind of new era. Right, but they need to diversify their economy away from oil, and they're spending $500 billion on this new mega city called Neon. And there's been rumors that they're going to sell wine, beer, and cocktails there. And I guess alcohol is kind of table stakes if you want to attract foreign investors because you have all these soccer players coming in, you have entertainment uh, moguls and tech, and you know, they like to have a cocktail afterward. Well, it's also like alcohol historically throughout all of human history has been a way to kind of bond and create community. And so even though in, of course, in moderation, but that is something if you're trying to build a civilization, if you look back through history, alcohol is usually plays a well, a specifically role. business deals. Right, that too. All right, so my last number was about a historic first for a store opening. My final number is about a historic first for a store closing. Burger chain In and Out is closing its store in Oakland, California, marking the first time in the company's 75 year history that it will shut down a location. The reason? Crime in the local area. The company said that its customers and staff members are regularly victimized by car break-ins, property damage, theft, and armed robberies. And so while this location was still profitable, in and out said it wasn't safe to continue operating it. Of course, this brings to mind many other retailers that have closed up shop across the country, citing a surge in crime. Several reports, though, have cast doubt on those motivations, particularly at Target. They've produced data that shows level of crime was not worse near those store locations compared to others in the same city. Still, at least in Oakland, violent crimes were up 21 percent and robberies rose 37 percent last year. Right. It is kind of a an area thing because nationally violent crime fell to 8.2% in 2023 after a rise in 2021. But as you said, in Oakland, it's at 21%. So there is just a lot of crime in this area. You don't often see 
a brand specifically pointing to crime because when t remember, when Target closed those scores and did it, people kind of pushed back against it. But in and out did not mince words here at no. all. They said it is crime. Our employees feel unsafe and we just can't operate operate anymore, even though the store is profitable. OK, well, thank you for those numbers, Neil. Well, it's time You're to welcome. move on, though. So I know some of you listening to the show might have only started paying attention to business news more recently. And if so, might have missed out on the SPAC mania of 2020 and 2021. It was a wild time, let me tell you. SPACs, a.k.a. special purpose acquisition companies, are essentially shell companies that list themselves on the stock market for the sole purpose of merging with a private company to take it public. It's sort of a corporate sleight of hand that allows companies to sell stock to investors with a lot less of the typical disclosures that come along with a more traditional IPO. That always rubbed the SEC the wrong way, and yesterday, the commission voted to adopt rules to re require additional disclosures around the SPAC process in order to protect consumers from getting a raw deal. Uncertainty around these impending regulations definitely popped the SPAC bubble. More than 860 SPACs raised $246 billion in 2020 and 2021, but last year saw just 31 SPACs raise just $3.8 billion. Neil, the headlines yesterday were reading that this is the end of SPAC mania. Is this the end and is it a yes. justified end? This, uh, when you read into how the, the mechanisms of SPACs work, you wonder how it was ever legal. I mean, they've been around for decades uh, and had not really been used as a way to go public, but they boomed during the really low interest rate environments of 20 and tw 2020 and 2021, uh, very much in line with the crypto boom and the meme stock mania of GameStop AMC we saw during the same time. The main problem with SPACs is that they're so tilted in favor of the people who create them. They have such more profit-making ability. They don't really have to put that much skin in the game, and it's tilted all the way against the regular investor. So you see people like Chamath, who's this billionaire venture capitalist. He was kind of the symbol of the, the SPAC boom. His SPACs failed. Like his specs were so, most of his specs were so bad. They had Virgin Galactic, a bunch of other ones that have kind of fell so much in value recently, but he still made $750 million from specs. Meanwhile, regular investors are left holding the bag. Yeah. The problem is the incentive structure because the, it's very favorable terms for, like you said, their creators known as sponsors. They get to put up a small amount of money to kind of cover the expenses, but then they get the option of getting a 20% stake at really, really big discounts. Meanwhile, it's just not a very efficient way of going public because once you subtract the, the banker's fees, the sponsor's cut, the lawyer's fees, early investors' fees, the SPAC might only have 50 cents for every dollar invested. So again, remember the purpose of going public is to raise money for a company to use. And if you're going public in a way that only gives you 50 cents on the dollar, not a very efficient use of capital. No. So the SEC says now, hey, if you're going public, we need more disclosures. You need to do it the traditional way. There, none of this loophole SPAC stuff where you don't have to like ground your projections in reality and you can rip off regular investors. So I think a lot of people on Wall Street kind of waiting for this to happen because whenever you see celebrities getting into a particular right. thing, I mean, A-Rod had one, Jay-Z had one, Shaq had one. Every uh, celebrity getting in there, that is a telltale sign we're at the top. I remember the Shaq SPAC. Those were the days. Finally, it feels Feels like we're in the depths of winter, but the telltale signs of spring are all around us. The sun is setting well after five. Masters commercials are playing on the TV. And Chipotle is hiring a ton of workers to prepare for burrito season. Yes, that is a thing. Chipotle announced yesterday it aims to recruit 19,000 new employees ahead of its busiest stretch for sales March through May, which it calls burrito season. That's a 27% jump from last year's burrito season push when it hired 15,000 new employees. Chipotle isn't just going after any employee, though. It's targeting a specific demographic, Gen Z. And to get Gen Z to work at your establishment, you're going to have to throw them some very Gen Z-specific perks. For Chipotle, that includes a 4% match toward their 401k if they make student loan payments, covering six free mental health counseling sessions. 
and offering access to a high-tech credit card known as the Tesla of banking. So Chipotle is throwing in all these perks to recruit young workers in a restaurant industry that has perennially suffered from high turnover and labor shortages. I mean, burrito season <laughs> gets me fired up. To me, that is the real first sign of spring. Seeing how many workers Chipotle is going to hire for burrito season is the new Groundhog Day. If it's above 15,000, that means we're getting an early spring below six more weeks of winter. So we're getting an early spring this year, baby. Also, is there another company with such a large Gen Z labor force. Gen Z workers make up 73% of its restaurant workforce, which again, I genuinely am wondering if a company has a higher percentage of Gen Z workers. Very interesting. So I, I haven't gone to Chipotle recently, but have you gone in and noticed that yeah, it's just, a bunch of youngins? It's just a bunch of youngins. And because youngins do love Chipotle, like they still identify with the brand. And then these perks are pretty decent, honestly. I think the credit card is the most interesting to me because it helps build and boost credit scores immediately, which is something that if you're working as a fast food worker or a uh, fast casual worker, you might not think about right out of the gate. Like you're just trying to make a buck and it's probably one of your, your first or second jobs. And so allowing them to build and boost credit, I do think is a, a perk beyond maybe like these mental health mm -hmm. ca counseling sessions that has a real tangible impact on your financial future. Do you buy burrito season though? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess it's it's. I guess the justification or the reasons behind it is that it's warmer. People are going outside. The sun's you know the sun's out a little more in the day. You're more likely to go get a burrito uh, if it's sunny out. I also think another key factor here is Chipotle is a lot in these college towns, right? And I think a lot of you know a lot of students are away during January. They come back in February, and uh, you know they go to these stores over the course of the spring semester when they're studying for exams. But it's not exactly what you'd think. A of the summer of people stuffing themselves with you know queso yeah. filled burritos it just feels wrong to eat a burrito in the winter for some reason what? like i don't know just when it's dark outside it just feels better when it's warm out. i don't feel any seasonality to my burrito <laughs> consumption but we have to wrap it up there hope you all heard something to spark a conversation today toby what is our swing thought for this rainy thursday today's swing thought is quote what good is the warmth of summer without the cold of winter to give it sweetness from Love the famous it. author john steinbeck honestly i don't even agree with this one though what? living in florida and not not freezing during the winter is pretty nice, but for anyone living through a dark, cold winter right now, try to keep try to keep the sweet summer to come in mind. As someone who has experienced all four seasons my whole life, I wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Steinbeck there. If you have any feedback on the show or just want to say good morning, please write into our email morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. Let's roll the credits. Emily Milliron is back as our editor and producer. Samantha Velas and Raymond Liu are associate producers. Fan favorite Yuchenna Waogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and makeup has decided to only work on Mondays. Must be nice. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow.